In this opening faculty roundtable entitled Race and the Transformation of Disciplines, we are extremely fortunate to have five terrific scholars who will share their perspectives on these issues. Each will offer approximately five minutes of opening comments, which will be followed by a brief intra-panel discussion, and then we will have the re remainder of our time to take your questions. I'm going to now offer a very brief introduction to each of our speakers in the order in which they will speak. And you should know that in the chat, we also have links to their full bios if you are interested in having that information uh, at this point. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, our first speaker will be Rod Ferguson, who's a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies and American studies at Yale University. Ferguson's research and teaching interests include the politics of culture, women of color feminism, the study of race, critical university studies, queer social movements, and social theory. Matthew Gatero is professor of Africana Studies and American Studies and the chair of American Studies at Brown. He's a history, historian of race and nation with a focus on the US from the Civil War to the present. Marcy Kwan is an assistant professor of art and art history at Stanford University. Her research and teaching interests include the intersection of fine art and vernacular practice, theories of modernism, cultural exchange between Asia and the Americas, folk and self-taught art, and issues of race and objecthood. Noemi uh, Diame is an assistant professor of English at the University of Chicago. Her research and teaching explores the relationship between theater understood simultaneously as a medium, a practice, an industry, an institution, a social force, and a vibrant, malleable set of literary forms, and the social, political, cultural struggles of early modernity. And finally, we will hear from Teresa Montoya, who is the provost's postdoctoral fellow, and in 2022 will be an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago. She's a social scientist and media maker, trained in sociocultural anthropology, critical indigenous studies, and filmmaking. Please join me in welcoming virtually uh, our panelists, and we will now hear from Rod Ferguson. Thank you. All right, well, thanks so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to set my watch for five minutes so that I don't go over. Um, you know, for me, the question of uh, the racial reckoning with the disciplines begins with um, the question of the reorganization of knowledge, one, and its relationship to uh, the cultivation of underrepresented and new communities of subjects within the university. Um, within and also outside of the discipline. And I'll say more about that a bit later. But um, this was something that was driven home for me when I was a grad student at UC San Diego, uh, being advised by George Lipsitz and Lisa Lowe. There was something about that moment in which things clicked for me, that the work that we were doing was not simply a textual exercise. Right, that it had institutional um, and epistemological implications. Things were supposed to shift. Um, that the work, in fact, the work that we were doing in our dissertations uh, for the professors in their books, it was to announce both epistemic shifts and also institutional shifts uh, within um, fields on campuses in terms of faculty and also in terms of students. And so that was a profound uh, revelation for me that it wasn't simply a kind of professional exercise, the study of race and its impact on the disciplines. Um, it wasn't simply a kind of professional exercise that was used to satisfy certain benchmarks in terms of uh, the awarding of a PhD or promotion, that it was about reorganizing the taken for granted knowledges uh, within certain fields, introducing other forms of knowledge within those fields, and also making space for underrepresented uh, people, new subjects, new communities, um, 
who would also take up the question or the act of reckoning uh, and offer really new kinds of innovations uh, at the level of scholarship. Um, there is a passage uh, in Jacques Derrida's uh, The Eyes of the University that kind of summed it up for me. You know, I'd always had that sense again from um, my time at UC San Diego, the work that I was doing, um, you know, with my colleagues there, the advising that I was getting from people like George and Lisa, but it wasn't until, you know, I encountered this passage from Derrida that I had language for um, the institutional and social importance of the work that we were doing. And so I'll just read a bit from that passage. All right, he says, with students and the research community in every operation we pursue together, a reading, an interpretation, the construction of a theoretical model, the rhetoric of an argumentation, the treatment of historical material, and even a mathematical formalization, we posit or acknowledge that an institutional concept is at play, a type of contract signed, an image of the ideal seminar constructed, a socius in implied, repeated, or displaced, invented, transformed, threatened, or destroyed, an institution is not merely a few walls or some outer structures surrounding, protecting, guaranteeing, or restricting the freedom of our work. It is also and already the structure of our interpretation. And so part of what uh, I find so useful about that is that it gets at the immediacy of um, the reckoning, that the reckoning happens at the moment that we're thinking about the book we're going to write, the course we're going to teach, how we frame those things. Um, and that in those very immediate and small acts, we're actually trying to either repeat a discipline or um, you know, displace disciplinary knowledge in the name of alternative forms of knowledge. All right, so I'll stop there. Thank you. I have spent much of the pandemic thinking about a 40-year-old novel, uh, Octavia Butler's Kindred, and I want to talk a little bit about it before I share my thoughts about the humanities. Published in 1979, the book tells the story of a Black woman named Dana who suddenly, inexplicably, and repeatedly transported back to the antebellum South to save her ancestor, a white slave owner named Rufus. Whenever Rufus's life is threatened, Dana is yanked backwards in time without warning or control. Her reappearances though keep Rufus alive and by extension ensure her very existence. And by the novel's conclusion, Dana is fundamentally changed by this recursive experience, leaving us to wonder about causality and inevitability. The world around her notably remains just as disturbingly uneven as it was at the start. Now, Dana is a hero for our pandemic. Nonplussed by her time traveling, she's practical and level-headed, routinely confronts terror with thoughtful planning. After her first dislocation, she returns home and has the forethought to wide, wisely assemble a bag of necessary supplies, tying them to her waist. She brings maps and history books from the present into the past, along with knives and painkillers, soap and toothpaste and clothing. Like the author who created her, Dana is defined by lists and is a champion of organized thinking in the face of calamity. This faith and relentless practicality saves her life. The knife she brings back in time, the kind of weapon denied to any enslaved person, the kind of weapon she knew she might need, is what she uses to kill Rufus in the novel's final pages. I've shared Kindred more times than I can count in the last 12 months. My deepest hope has been that the students who are now zooming into our meetups from bedrooms, kitchen tables, and patios in almost every conceivable time zone and who might feel displaced, buffeted, and even scared can find in Dana's steely determination a practical model for their own everyday survival. There's a valuable lesson here for us too as we ponder the relationship between race and the humanities. All of Dana's courage and imagination inevitably leads her right back to the present. 
there's no other timeline and no counterfactual reality. Her movements back and forth from the antebellum South to the modern present change nothing in her world. She gains memories, a measure of herself, and a sober understanding of the realities of slavery, but she loses something too. After Rufus's death, she materializes back in present day California, her arm painfully adjoined to the timbers and nails and plaster of the house. Its removal sets her free, but leaves her without a limb. I really couldn't let her come all the way back, Butler ex once explained to Randall Kennan. I couldn't let her return to what she was. I couldn't let her come back whole. When I was first asked to consider the idea of a racial reckoning, I returned once more to Kindred. A reckoning I know is a dramatic settlement of debts. It can be a jarring event, a disruptive, painful occurrence. It should cost. And who should bear that cost? I thought of field-locked history departments and English departments unable to truly center racial justice in their work because of an old fashioned commitment to geographic or temporal divisions that date back to Jim Crow, to white supremacy or to empire. I thought of entire disciplines, classics for instance, or medieval studies where the labor of decades is now the foundation stone of white supremacy. I thought of the small interdisciplines, many of them zeroed in on race, all of them starved for resources compared to their larger peers and overdetermined as the place where race happens or is or will be. I thought of budget models like RCM, which valorize student credit hours over righteousness or social importance. I thought of all of this and so much more and asked exactly what sort of reckoning should there be? Such questions come to me even as I am overwhelmed joyfully and ecstatically by the volume of work in the humanities on race. I am drowning in books, in podcasts, in graphic novels, in think pieces, in documentaries, and in Twitter threads, surrounded at home and at work by disorganized piles, alphabetical piles, thematic piles, and color-coded piles. Every single one of them evidence that the dam has burst, that we are in some very perverse way fortunate to be writing and thinking through all of this, our own dystopia together with such a vast and extraordinary assemblage of people, authors of some of the best work ever conceived. What would it mean to center this everywhere? How could that happen? And what would that cost the humanities? To paraphrase Butler, after a true reckoning with our past and present, would we want to bring the university all the way back? The humanities will someday have a reckoning and that reckoning will, I think, tear these places apart and leave them conceptually burning and broken. There's some promise in our prospective losses in what parts of these places might be cut off. And we in this Zoom should all be planning for it with knapsacks tied to our waists, filled with old maps and history books, painkillers and knives and soaps and toothpastes. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. I have a can't do anything without images. So. so this year, the Cantor Art Center, which is the University Art Museum here at Stanford, um, launched the Asian American Art Initiative, co-directed by myself and Elisa Alexander, curator of American art. The initiative is dedicated to the collection preservation research and exhibition of work by Asian American and diaspora artists, who with the exception of a handful of canonical figures remain almost entirely unknown in art history. The dearth of interest and support for Asian American artists within art history stands in direct contrast to the historical importance of the arts to Asian Americans. While researching the 2009 survey text, Asian American Art of History, 1850 to 1970, Mark Dean Johnson, who actually worked on this project as a fellow at CSRE, and Stanford historian Gordon Chang identified over 1,000 artists of Asian descent working in California alone during this chronological span, which is again, 1850 to 1970. 
So this number is staggering, um, indicating not only the significance of art and art making for Asian Americans, but also the enormous volume of work that remains to be studied and has likely been lost to time. And what you see on your screen is actually, um, they're photographs from May's Photo Studio, which was um, a Chinese run photography studio in San Francisco Chinatown, um, akin to James Van Der Zee, you know, photographing the community. Um, and these works were saved actually from a dumpster in the 1970s by the artist Wiley Wong. Um, what you see here are maquettes of photographs that were actually pieced together in the dark room, um, kind of uniting families that were um, uh, divided by um, American, American legal, like exclusionary um, immigration policy. So we launched this year with a collection that includes 151 historical works from the estate of a private collector, which were being held in a storage locker in San Rafael. Um, which you see on the screen on the left. Um, we also received donations from foundations of artists such as Martin Wong and Bernie Spang, um, whose work you see on the right, um, it's actually covered in plastic, which is why it looks like that. Um, on the left is a painting from the Brown Collection by um, the first documented Japanese American painter um, in the United States. Um, and we also acquired an untitled wall of masks by the artist Ruth Asawa, who cast them from the faces of uh, visitors to her home. Um, and they include people like Anna Devere Smith. Um, we have also made it a priority to ensure that we preserve archival material from these artists. So Asian American Studies has helped me think through the ethical dimensions of this project. It is not lost on me that part of art history's conservatism has to do with its emphasis on physical objects, objects that are bought and sold, making it more obviously entangled with market forces than other academic disciplines. This has also made art history especially reliant on institutions such as museums to undertake the extensive and expensive conservation, preservation, and display of works of art. And finally, there is the problem of the way that race and identity discourse are mobilized by institutions as a means to manage dissent, um, an issue that Rod's work, as well as um, Riley, um, Riley's edited volume with Hentai Gap has helped me think through. So we've tried to navigate these ethical challenges in multiple ways. Um, in our discussions of the Asian American Art Initiative, we always begin with the fact that Stanford is itself unthinkable without the entwined histories of Chinese immigrant labor, imperialist expansion, and capitalism, as Manu Kuruka has shown. And um, in fact, the golden last spike and the silver mallet used to hammer it into place, the joining of the Transcontinental Railroad are at the Cantor Arts Center. Um, recent archeological work has also revealed that even the palm trees on Palm Drive were planted by Chinese laborers. So another goal of our work is to show how historical research and deep formal engagement with works of art breaks rather than reinforces a monolithic idea of Asian America um, as a bounded identity form, as well as its assumptions of um, a, a single nation state. And rather than keeping our work in the feedback loop of academia, the museum and the art world, we're trying to make sure that we engage local communities in part through education and public programming. Um, and most importantly, we know that our efforts cannot benefit just the community of Asian Americans, but all racialized groups whose histories and lives are entangled with ours. And I want to acknowledge that CSRE and Jen Brody um, in particular have been unfailingly supportive of these efforts. So still, I must admit that I have serious reservations about how our work will be used, something that keeps me up at night. Um, museums are, of course, colonial institutions built on the hoarding of property and increasingly reliant on the commodification of people of color. All I can say is that I believe the work of these artists have many things to teach us about the structures that have attempted to circumscribe their existence. I can only imagine the things they will teach us about 
for example, racial capitalism and aesthetics, the way, quote, art has been historically tethered to the idea of the human, um, and hierarchies of taste and value. Art history should be the study of all of these things. But also, as Anne Cheng has pointed out more than 20 years ago and continues to remind us, um, in the United States, a person of color is seen as worthy of attention only when they have suffered visible harm. While Asian American artists have never been outside of history, they invite us to think and feel in ways that perhaps sidestep this obsession with injury. Their work shows us the multiple and complex ways Asian Americans have lived, worked, created, desired, and imagined in relation to a world that seeks ever more devious ways to homogenize and devalue them. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am thrilled to be here in the presence of such brilliance, and I'm really excited to learn from everybody today. I hope to contribute something to this ongoing conversation by telling you a little bit about the current state of my field, early modern critical race studies, uh, and telling you about its current state through the lens of our key concept, racial reckonings. So what do we do? Early modern critical race scholars examine the deployment of racial formations in periods prior to the development of so-called scientific racism in the 18th century, starting in 1492. And we do so in various cultural domains, such as literature, performance, religion, visual culture, material culture, and more. The word reckoning, as was pointed out earlier, is etymologically embedded in practices of accounting. It's about numbers. It's about counting, putting in order, calculating, and including in that count what must be included and accounted for. The pioneers of my field had to counter the convenient assumption that there were no BIPOC people in early modern Europe, or uh, differently put, that Shakespeare had never seen a black person when he wrote Othello, quote unquote in order to make a case for the importance of racial thinking in early modern Europe. We are indebted to the, to the subfield of present studies best illustrated by the painstaking work of the late Imtiaz Habib and his marvelous Black Lives in the English Archives for some serious reckoning. For the field uh, can only grow, uh, I'm sorry, for the field to grow, reckoning in the accountant sense applied and still applies not only to the archives, but to those who read them. It has thus been imperative in our field to reckon with the dismal numbers of BIPOC scholars in early modern studies. The most English curricula, as you know, have a Shakespeare requirement, but to the best of my knowledge, there are only currently less than 20 tenure track um, faculty members who identify as Black Shakespeare uh, professors in the US at the moment. We also have had and still have to start building diverse pipelines, which is an ongoing struggle because BIPOC students are conditioned or maybe disciplined from high school onwards into thinking of the pre-modern periods as irrelevant to their concerns. Of course, that's a, that is a, a misconception. We know that Stuart Hall originally wanted to be a medievalist and that Sylvia Winter, for instance, was primarily trained as a specialist of early modern uh, Spanish drama. In short, racial reckonings in my field have been about changing both the objects that we study and the demographics of scholars who study them. But of course, a disciplinary field can only be transformed if its theoretical frameworks, tools, and questions are transformed as well. Early modern critical race studies emerged historically in the mid 90s when scholars like Kim F. Hall brought theoretical frameworks drawn from black feminism and critical race theory to bear on early modern materials and to make early modern studies accountable. Anya Lumba around the same time did the same with frameworks drawn from post-colonial feminism. A second wave of scholarship on race in the early modern period started in the first decade of the 21st century, and we are now in the third or fourth, depending on how you count, uh, wave of scholarship in the field. Yet valid concerns have been expressed by field founders Kim F. Hall and Peter Erickson in 2016 in the 2016 special issue of Shakespeare Quarterly focused on race. And they alerted us in that issue to the risks of dispersion to the very real risk that the field, even as it starts receiving institutional recognition in various forms, might lose its political impetus and its original concern with racial justice. 
To honor and to act upon the activist drive that founded the field, a research collaborative such as Race Before Race, which was founded by Ayanna Thompson and, um, and U Chicago is a partner institution of Race Before Race, that collaborative has for the last couple of years advocated in various forms for the centrality of critical race theory to the field. If you're curious to hear more, I encourage you to check the webpage of Race Before Race. Our next symposium, I'm sorry, I have to make a quick plug. Our next symposium focused on politics, that's the theme, with a keynote by Ibram Kendi opens this coming Tuesday. But to return to my point, racial reckoning is about political accountability, which must be intentionally cultivated at all times in my field. We were asked to think about the ways in which we center racial justice in our work, and it is perhaps um, for research, the research part of our work, that the question is most urgent. An example might be useful at this point. In my most recent article, uh, making my work politically accountable to the present has meant that when I started noticing slippages in 17th century plays, which depict and label the same characters alternately as blackamoors and Romani, gypsies, I had to think about those modern, those early modern slippages through the lens of the many instances today when scholars working in the fledgling field of critical Romani studies invoke paradigms from Black studies in pursuit of shared liberation. This led me to read the early modern archive as providing an ethically binding genealogy for those critical alliances, which are reconstituting now. Methodologically speaking, doing such work requires never forgetting about the present as you analyze the past, developing some sort of double vision, moving to and fro between historicization and theorization. Racial reckonings also transform disciplinary affects. To do this work, you have to keep in mind that the stakes of the work, as you know, Rod was pointing out earlier, um, the stakes of the work, which are so real, they outweigh the playful dimension of aesthetic exploration, which is one of the main appeals of literary studies. And you have to pay close attention to the ways in which paranoid or reparative leanings might inform your own scholarship and its reception, because those matter. I will close by saying that working uh, with theoretical bodies of knowledge produced in other disciplines, such as critical race theory, black studies, sociology, and in my case, performance studies and dance studies, is a move that is welcome in English studies. English has historically been characterized as a discipline by anti-disciplinary drives, at least in the departments where I have had the good fortune to work and in very recent years. Thus, I have personally found English to be a good non-disciplining discipline to operate from. But I do think that the future developments of early modern critical race studies require expanding in transnational and multilinguistic directions, so taking the project in a complete direction, if you will, because the invention of whiteness in the pre-modern era was a transnational endeavor. So such expansion is in tune with the transnational and diasporic dynamics that have always been at the core of black studies. And I believe that the study of race along those lines can help early modern English studies move past the Anglo-centrism that has for so long limited their purview and potential. Thank you. Um, and Yate, thank you to the organizers for convening this important dialogue. Um, for my Indigenous colleagues who are tuning in, I will also introduce myself as a Dene woman. My so-called interracial heritage is revealed in the introduction of my four Dene clans. My mother's clan is followed by my non-native father of Mexican and German-American ancestry. But unlike Euro-American categories of racial and ethnic classification, Diné and indigenous epistemologies are shared in order to find connection, identify a means of relation and also responsibility to each other rather than social difference. It is perhaps of this knowledge so ingrained in my identity formation, living in and between my mother's birth home on the Navajo Nation, and the off reservation places that she carried me, that curiosities of my own racialized difference took hold. For many BIPOC scholars, our own histories and vulnerabilities are what drives the work that we do. 
And also what makes it so difficult because our bodies, our skin and our histories can also become uncomfortable points of critical interrogation. Increasingly, I'm finding strength in this radical vulnerability as a way of reckoning my own place in the trajectory of historically white academic spaces, the role that our disciplinary founders, in quotes here, have played in shaping these discourses and how this knowledge can be employed in our pedagogy, activism, and public engagements to confront structures of racism, white supremacy, and settler colonial violence. So I present this intimate portrait as an invitation for us to explore the differential ways that race is invoked in discussions of blackness and indigeneity and Asian studies, and what connections might be forged between our overlapping and unique struggles. These concerns, of course, are by no means new. In the discipline of anthropology, in which I was trained, for instance, scholars like Lee Baker have interrogated how categories of culture were deployed to study the so-called disappearing Indians by early American ethnologists, while categories of race were used by early sociologists to study African Americans. The problems of classification and differentiation are not only a disciplinary one, but also a trademark of colonial and imperial power. Consider now the category of Indian. The fallacy of the title references a gross navigational error by the mass murderer Christopher Columbus. As documented in his own journals, the transatlantic voyage of Columbus set in motion centuries of European colonization in the Americas. Under his leadership, the indigenous population of Hispaniola, now Haiti in the Dominican Republic, estimated between 500,000 to 1 million people in 1492, plummeted to 60,000 within a single generation. Following this violent encounter, European philosophers and theologians began to consider the morality and humanity of the native inhabitants that they, quote, discovered. Did they have souls? Did they possess reason? Could they be governed? Contrary to the assumption that conquest was justified through the construction of radical alterity, colonization under the Spanish empire, legitimized through the Christian logic of divine hierarchical power, made the Indian into a rational and legible subject in order to be governable. On the other hand, as argued by scholars such as Stuart Banner, the British were less concerned about soul matter or capacity for rationality within a humanistic tradition. Rather, the colonization of North America required an initial, initial recognition of indigenous property ownership to the extent that if the English wanted Indian land, then they would have to purchase it. The recognition of native property, it seems, was only in the moment in the sale transaction. This larger notion of political recognition engaged by scholars such as Arja Simpson, Glenn Coulthard, Beth Povinelli, and property is central to ongoing political debates over indigenous sovereignty and their right to existence in settler colonial states of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States today. Therefore, to reckon with the violence of racial classification is also to confront the persistent structures of whiteness, which as Aboriginal scholar Eileen Morton Robertson argues, is rooted within logics of possession, whether it be owning property, being property, or becoming property less. These ideas around property and possession form the basis of a settler and a white national identity an identity that many native scholars have argued is also predicated on the dispossession of indigenous land, the dilution of indigenous blood and identity through blood quantum politics, as critically explored by Lakota scholar Kim Talbear and Osage scholar Jean Dennison, and the erasure of limitations of indigenous sovereignty in federal Indian policy. So to bring us back to the title of our panel today, Racial Reckonings, I'd like to for all of us to consider the tangible ways we can build upon existing race conversations to imagine how we might translate these disciplinary and historical differences into greater solidarity around movements for reparations and land acknowledgements in our respective campuses. This is by no means an end goal, but rather one way to demand a radically different relationship of universities with their histories and those they serve. Thank you and ehehe. Thank you, everyone. Those were 
phenomenal uh, opening comments with so much depth and complexity. Um, usually I have lots of synthetic questions. I have a couple <laughs> because I'm still digesting. That was amazing. Um, I want to open, if you don't mind, with a very broad question that I think most of you, if not all of you, sort of touched indirectly on um, in, in your comments uh, at one point or another. Um, and so let me ask the question and then I'll see if I can remind the audience of a few of the examples of, of when it was, when it came up. Um, so my, my sort of broad sort of intentionally a little bit provocative question is, um, do you think the disciplinary structures that we are grappling with are capable of um, being a part of the transformations, being a productive part of the transformations that your collective work is speaking to, right? That is to say, um, are, are they going to be blown up? Matt sort of has a, a, an image that they're going to disintegrate. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, um, you know, Rod talked a bit about, right, the, the ways in which there's a, an institutional and epistemological challenge, which implies, right, that things are going to have to be dramatically changed. Um, you know, Marcy's talking about the, the role of this kind of the art, bringing these objects into places that are colonial, but also transforming that relationship as three quick examples. But, you know, are these institutions really capable of this? You know, I, mean, I guess I want to push a few of you, if you're interested in taking the challenge to sort of um, really explore that, right? I mean, I understand what we're doing in relation to these institutions, but when we're in our re relative cubbies, it doesn't seem like a lot of disruptions happening. When we're together in a cohort, there seems like a lot of disruption of amazing scholars. But there's a lot of people doing this work in, in the way that we would be challenged by. So I'm just throwing it open. Um, I don't know anyone, I, I'm open to anyone. I, I think I mentioned Marcy, Matt, and Rod, so maybe one of you could start us off and then everyone is open to, to engage. Okay, well, maybe I'll go. Um, oh, thanks, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. Um, you know, I think it's difficult for every field, you know, within a university because especially the disciplines, I mean, even the category, the discipline, you know, is in and of itself, it means a resistance to um, change, innovation, shifts, blah, blah, blah. And it's not as if the inner disciplines are immune from that because you know, they're also subject to those logics. At the same time, um, even with the problems of the interdisciplinary fields, I would put my money on the interdisciplines over the disciplines in terms of the kinds of uh, changes that you're talking about, right? If you look at where are the minoritized faculty hired, located, uh, students, underrepresented students in terms of majors located. Uh, it's in the end of disciplines. I mean, I'll never forget a conference that I was symposium that I went to years ago, I think like in 2011 um, at UCLA between the UCLA Center for the Study of Women and NYU's counterpart. They had a joint conference and Kathleen McHugh, who was the uh, director of the center at UCLA had a slide up you know, saying, showing where all of the underrepresented faculty were, you know, in the university. And they were all in the interdisciplines. So the question was, if we took away the interdisciplines, what would then happen to those faculty members? They would be gone, okay? And so if you think about, that's one example. If you think about another example, you know, um, I'm a bit biased here, but I also think it's true. The American Studies Association. Right, and all of these sort of epistemic revolutions that field has gone through, you know, from you know the immediate end of World War II, in terms of American studies really being an alibi for the U.S. during the Cold War period, but also then being changed by uh, the social movements around race and gender, and then being changed again 
by uh, the critique of U.S. empire and globalization, you know, thinking here of that cultures of U.S. imperialism um, book from Amy Kaplan and Don Pease, that anthology, but then changed again in terms of post-nationalist American studies, then changing again because of uh, the work of scholars in disability studies, um, in queer studies and trans studies and in indigenous studies, you know, so we can actually point to um, instances in which the interdisciplines have uh, been, you know, more ready to enact the kind of changes that you're talking about. There are still problems, you know, I don't want to lose sight of that, but in terms of um, the kinds of transformations, both epistemic and social, the interdisciplines that carry the day. I mean, they carry that history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So long live the interdisciplines. <laughs> long live the interdisciplines. Matt, did you want to jump in or Marcy or? Um, I'll, I'll buy Marcy some time um, I, I, to, uh, you know, I think Trisha, to answer your question directly, um, I don't, I think it's a question of whether the discipline should survive, whether the, whether the humanities should survive as they are. Uh, in order to in order to center racial justice or or just race in the humanities, and I don't think they should. I don't think they can. Um, I think that's this is the other side of the second paragraph after Rod's paragraph uh, about the the value of the interdisciplines, is that the disciplines themselves are inherently conservative uh, and hegemonic, and and that we we stand to have to fight department by department, field by field, subfield by subfield, in order to advance interests to get one hire, one faculty member, one course taught. Uh, and that, that struggle will outlive us. Um, there's, you know, we can't, we can't win that struggle. So it's, it is true that in some institutions, so much of this is university by university. Like I'm thinking about my own history department at Rutgers, which I much beloved, but which uh, centered black women's history from the moment I got there and was utterly formative to me. But most history departments, as you know, even within the US field have subdivisions that mitigate and, and constrain any department from actually hiring or focusing on race. Right. Yeah, it's a very effective mechanism. That's what I'm really trying to get at is that despite these incredible interventions, Right, there's been just a capacity to reproduce itself in all of its narrowness. But um, let me let Marcy uh, jump in. Marcy? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, sitting here trying to think about your question, all the only word that was going through my head was like, no, like it's, it's um, they're not capable museums are not capable, um, art history, you know, for all, for all the reasons we've been kind of delineating. Um, and as I tried to kind of point out in my presentation, it's just like this paradox that I have been grappling with and doing this work where, um, you know, it really started when I was teaching this class on Asian American art when I first got to Stanford in 2016. And I just realized how much of this work was in people's homes, you know, um, in their garages. Like these are works that have material lives. Um, you know, they endure in time. I mean, Ruth Asawa called those masks moments of stop time, which is on one hand, I think something that makes them so um, powerful. Um, and on the other hand, is what makes them fetish objects, right? Um, and, and people want to desire them so much. And so like that contradiction seems to me to be built like directly into the character of an art object itself, you know? And of course there are like kind of contemporary practices that attempt to critique and deconstruct this, but like, you know, I'm, we're talking about um, an entire kind of history of work. Um, and so I think that, you know, um, I think that for now, all I've been trying to do is um, in some ways tolerate that paradox mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and know that this work, you know, the Bernice Bing that I showed you, um, part of the condition of taking it was, um, it was damaged in a fire. Mm -hmm. um, and we're 
you know, the museum has the resources to restore it. Um, and, and she tried to, it was important to her, it was from 65, and she tried to restore it at the end of her life um, before she passed. And so, like, um, you know, those moments I know are important, but ultimately I think the accretion, if we're really trying to move towards like racial justice is that they will destroy the institutions that they're in. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is one of the tensions. Okay, I have one more and then I'm gonna move to mm -hmm. our, our, our audience questions. I just wanna encourage people who are listening to place their questions in the Q and A and we'll, we'll do our best to get to them. Uh, one more thing, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to ask Teresa and Noemi to, to sort of begin, but everyone's welcome as to jump in, and that is this really interesting tension between um, the the expression of the a number of you used to to the the influence of of racial analysis to force a change in the objects, um, and that by changing the objects we are in the process of of doing some kind of important racially transformational work. Noemi, you mentioned this. Um, Teresa, I think you said something along these lines. Uh, and and uh, by interesting contrast, I think Rod, you were the only one to talk about sort of new subjects in the university mm -hmm. coming into, into place. So I'm, I'm um, and then of course, Matt, you, the objects that uh, Dana brings back, right, are, are extremely important for, for her survival. So, I'm interested in this tension around objects, the importance of, of, of using objects, but of course the objectification, the fact that racial subjects are in fact the original objects um, and what to do with that tension. Um, and to just talk a little bit more about, you know, what, what this changing of objects means in the disciplines and whether or not it must be accompanied by a change in subjects uh, and, and, and how those things might fit together. Teresa, do you, do you want to go first? I'm, I'm um, happy to go if, if you prefer. Yeah, I guess um, I might come back to this after you again. Um, as the sole social scientist here, um, I might be coming at this question a little bit differently. Um, maybe I'll just answer this by way of explaining my own desire or impulse to even go into anthropology. Um, as many of you may know, I mean, anthropology was a discipline that relied extensively upon the study of others, of Native Americans, of our bones, um, our, our literal bodies, right? And this, um, you know, also filled uh, museum collections, um, early ethnological collections. So, you know, my interest was really around the material culture and actual objects, right? So my initial um, desire to go into anthropology was through museum anthropology. I, I wanted to be in these museum spaces to help try to try to curate this history in a more appropriate way, um, in a way that was more respectful to um, my ancestors and our relatives that are literally still in these museum collections. And like all of you that have expressed, you know, these um, this caution around the the potential for institutional change. You know, I felt that very strongly actually with museums, and it actually was part of the the reason why um, I've even though I continue to do museum work and I continue to um, guest curate um, for exhibitions. Um, I still found potential in education itself. So this is why I've gone through this route of um, doing research and education rather than going the route of becoming a curator. That being said, you know, there's still um, a lot to be changed within anthropology. Um, you know, at the University of Chicago, I'm one of just a few native faculty who have ever existed, <laughs> you know, um, and there is no existing native studies program. Um, you know, when I was hired and when I accepted, um, you know, it was on the condition that there would be, you know, this Native Studies uh, program in formation. So I'm still, um, I know there's these conversations happening and there's, there's definitely um, some movement, but I know that this will take time. Institutional change takes time. Um, so for myself, where I, I see um, maybe the potential for change and what I think all of us maybe should be pushing back against um, across each of our disciplines is just the single author model. Like that's something that is, has become increasingly bothersome to me that I didn't really question at all as a graduate student. 
Um, and I've had these conversations with a lot of other folks. So now that I'm in my postdoc, I have found myself actually increasingly collaborating with people in other disciplines um, in the sciences, you know, in, in public health or um, folks who are working in hydrology, like things I didn't really imagine before, but it was because the problems that I'm confronting in my research, I think necessitates um, people who are doing that like on the ground work and I can bring like a historical or a political sort of analysis to that sort of work. Um, and I work on environmental contamination and indigenous sovereignty in, in the Southwest. Um, so these, these are kind of some of my um, concerns that I've been you know, struggling with over the, the past year or two as I'm you know, now charting this new trajectory of my research. And obviously COVID has thrown a lot of my um, previous plans, um, you know, aj ajar a bit. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear from the rest of you about what, not just within our own disciplines and departments, but, you know, the larger structures of academia and how, how we can imagine change or, or ways to, um, you know, push back on, on these structures that have been, you know, um, confining to us. Yeah, to, so I, I'm going to answer um, your question, Tricia, about subjects versus objects, although there is no versus really. Uh, but just, I wanted to go back first to the question about disciplines. Can, can the disciplines help? Can they make it? Are they capable? Um, I will say that I personally have very little interest in disciplinarity or disciplines or the survival or capabilities of discipline. I got my PhD in theater from a department of English and comparative literature. And I was working mostly on Spanish and French lit <laughs> within that structure. So I think it's particularly the case for me, but it's the case of all of us that we are not working in a discipline. We're all working within a Venn diagram of multiple disciplines, right? Um, and so I would just say that I am very opportunistic about this. Uh, I don't have faith in the disciplines, but I also am very willing to mobilize them strategically. And for instance, right now I'm teaching a course called Black Shakespeare, and I am very willing, very ready to harness all the disciplinary <laughs> affordances of English, you know, studying the hyper canonical figure of Shakespeare, if it allows me to get students to think about race critically, to bring into the room all the founders of the field and, and, and thinkers in Black studies. Um, and I think a number of, of us have been doing that. I'm thinking about, you know, the, um, the involvement of major institutions like the Shakespeare Association of America, which has been a force of transformation in the field over the last couple of years. So I don't, you know, I don't want to sound too naive here. Uh, I think I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in line with everybody here, but um, I, I am very willing to be opportunistic as far as disciplines are concerned um, to make change happen. But concerning the objects versus uh, subject difference, perhaps I, I, I wasn't clear. I was actually um, trying to suggest that um, this, this um, involvement of my field in bu building a pipeline to diversify the, the professorate means that we are very acutely, <laughs> painfully acutely aware of the fact that we need new subjects doing this work. As I was mentioning, there are less than 20 faculty members who are Black Shakespeareans in this country, right? Every department, every, every, every English major is going to take a Shakespeare course at some point. 20 professors are Black doing this work. Um, so we are very aware of it, but the, to clarify what I meant when I said new objects, I don't mean that the objects themselves are changing. I mean that if you bring new subjects to work on them, they will see new things because the way we read the world is, is positioned and conditional upon our own positionality, right? So if you uh, get a scholar like me, for instance, who lives in a black body and is used to speaking with an accent, then the question of the black accents in the early modern repertoire is going to be something that they see in plays that other scholars had not seen before. For. So I think actually that the, the production of new objects of knowledge and new subjects, those are actually uh, completely embedded. They work together. And this is, this is the only way really to, to say new exciting things about a figure like Shakespeare at this point. Marcy or Matt or Rod, any things emerge from this that you want to weigh in on? Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Just, I just want to say um, what uh, Noemi and Teresa were saying 
is so totally uh, and devastatingly apparent that if you don't diversify the faculty at the same time that you diversify the, the material we study, you end up with the story of the Move family uh, and the story of Penn and, and Princeton, which is currently all over the news, um, which is a repeat of the story that Teresa started with, the ways in which um, you know, the, the pain of uh, minoritized subjects becomes the object of established disciplines uh, is, is, a, is just too familiar and uh, can't be repeated. Mm. You know, and I'll add that, um, you know, this is social movement wisdom, you know, in terms of the link between um, the constitution of the object and the simultaneous introduction of new subjects. You know, if you think about you know, for instance, what Angela Davis says in that documentary, Herbert's Hippopotamus, about Herbert Marcuse at UC San Diego. She's talking about the Lumumba Zapata movement um, in 1969, where the university says, we're gonna have a new college, it's gonna be called Third College. And she says, no, my comrades and I have decided it will be called Lumumba Zapata College. <laughs> it will not be called Third College. And we had a curriculum. Right, so they took over the college with the uh, intention of producing and introducing new subjects, peoples, communities into the college, and they had a curriculum, right? So that the introduction of these folks necessarily meant, you know, um, an epistemic shift mm -hmm. that there had to be. Um, a new way of understanding the world, the US, race, colonialism, the legacies of colonialism. And we see that kind of thing repeated, for instance, at um, the open admissions movement at City College, that the introduction in that context of African-Americans and Puerto Rican students, you know, anybody who wanted to be in could get in was the idea. They also produced, you know, a new curriculum and had a vision for school, the same thing for San Francisco State. So the link between um, the constitution of epistemic objects and the production of new subjects, that's social movement wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Marcy? Uh, um, so you mentioned San Francisco State, Rod. Um, you know, actually I was doing some work with, a, with an artist actually who um, has made work about um, the Third World Liberation Front, and he pulled out uh, an archival document he had in his studio because he was like hanging out with everyone. Um, and uh, one of the things on the Third World curriculum, like in '68, was Asia, it was an Asian American art course. Um, and so, so there's that. Um, but you know, I just want to say I agree with um, what everyone has said, of course, about um, new subjects and new objects being kind of entwined. Um, the you know, I, when I first drafted my talks, it was way too long. My remarks were way too long, but I had this story about like, which I'm sure all of us have similar stories, which is like, you know, like in 2014. So this was like seven years ago. And I know it was this date because it was, um, it was around the time of Ferguson. Um, I went to someone um, on faculty at the Institute of Fine Arts um, at NYU, where I was getting my PhD in art history. Um, there was no one on my committee or not my advisor um, and told him I wanted to work on race and Asian American things. Um, and he told me that um, I should work on Jewishness um, because art historians are Jewish and so they'll be more sympathetic to my topic. You know, it's like seven years ago. <laughs> Um, and I think that all of the assumptions um, about the relationship of subjects and objects is, is in that statement. Mm. Yeah. You say seven years ago with, you know, I'm not sure if that meant it was a long time ago or it was just yesterday. That's how horrible the thought is. I right? have, I have no idea, honestly, but. Um, it almost feels like, you know, a 19... 58 yeah. kind of comment. Yeah, yeah. Time, yeah. time flies and then it doesn't move at all. Yeah. yeah. And so that's just, um, it's just to say that art history is so conservative 
um, and has been for such a long time. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes even really hard to explain this to my friends in English. But they're like, you know, there's a subfield of Asian American studies. There's no or, um, Asian American literature. That subfield doesn't exist in art history. Mm-hmm. And I think the other thing about like new objects and the pipeline, you know, something that um, Teresa mentioned as well. It's like, I talk about this with my friends of color who are art historians all the time. Um, and we're like, it's the privilege of being able to work in a museum over the summer you know, um, and get that hands-on experience with objects. And then, you know, which then gives you connections to go into fellowships. And so academia is actually really interleaved with a lot of um, um, like kind of funding organizations that themselves still are, um, yeah, like are still kind of guided by, by capital. And so we, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of work to be done still. Right. I mean, and, and this this connects what you're saying, Marcy, to um, a broader issue. I'm going to just throw it out there while it's on my mind, but I do want to uh, start asking some audience questions, and there's a really a good one to start with. But, you know, there's this, um, this realization that um, the work uh, that has to be done is really, you know, the, the academic work is tethered to structures of power that that our departments, disciplines, and even some of our interdisciplines reinforce through a sense of hierarchy about what kinds of work matters, how that work is done, and who's going to evaluate the value of that work. Um, And, you know, just, you know, I mean, Noemi, I I agree that, you know, English is is a little more porous, but I'm, you know, I, I wouldn't say that the level of creative, you know, integration and complexity that you're doing is pretty standard in English departments. So, you know, <laughs> you know, we all have our, that's the problem with gathering, you know, creative people who are pushing all these boundaries because then we're like, hey, yeah, there's, look at us, we're here. And I'm like, yeah. And then there's like 40 million people standing over there in the corner in a, in a straight disciplinary line. So anyway, I won't go back to that because that's my pet peeve. But let, let me, this is a question for anyone who wants to answer it, um, but it's drawn on uh, Matt's uh, concept and part of what he said. So I'm gonna read the question and, and give you all a chance to answer it. Okay, this person is asking the following. I'm moved by Dr. Gutero's call for us to prepare for a reckoning that stands to be cataclysmic to the academy as we know it. I wanna ask the round table what their knives and their emergency packs are. Given that this reckoning is not just coming, but for graduate students, postdocs and adjuncts among us is already here. What are the contingency plans and alternative homes for intellectual work that we should be investing in? So there are two questions there. I will just ask that you take one and that will just give us room for other people to take another. So one is, what are the um, knives and emergency packs um, for, for, to prepare for the reckoning that stands to be cataclysmic in the academy? That's question A. So what's your you know, uh, emergency pack slash knife? And the other is given that the reckoning is basically here, what are the contingency plans and alternative homes for intellectual work that we should be investing in? And this kind of dovetails with what Rod was saying about having your own curriculum. Right, and, and as a possibility, now where that might be, we might have other locations, but I will open the floor to anyone who wants to pick up one or the other of those questions. Well, I'm, I'm happy to get us uh, started with, with the second question, you know, plan Bs. <laughs> what are some plan Bs? Um, I think the plan Bs are very compatible with the plan As to start with, but the my point is that I am thinking um, every every kind of work that will allow the transformation that we're trying to have happen in the plan A in the academy, um, every uh, single form of work that will enable that to radiate, right? For instance, we want uh, students to be, you know, in my field already invested, having, um, having some interest in working in pre-modern race studies, dealing with race and Shakespeare and how everything is working. 
it's already too late usually when they arrive in college level. They already think that Shakespeare and everything from that time period is not for them. So actually investing heavily in the training of our high school teachers and giving them the tools to do some of that work earlier on when it's still possible, that is really important. I'm also thinking about um, uh, the kind of work that we see um, um, partner institutions doing, for instance, Again, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about what I know. I'm thinking about the institutions uh, that I'm working with. And I'm thinking of the Newberry Library, for instance, which is at the moment really invested in animal and critical race studies and is trying to help make that work visible. So in 2023, Race Before Race is coming to Chicago. The Newberry Library is curating an exhibition that will be opened to everybody, to the Republic and to high school students in order to uh, you know, familiarize folks with those questions. There are jobs there. There are forms of expertise that we are trained to provide, that we are trained to give to our own students, our graduate students, and that we don't you know, have the time or the bandwidth to share with everybody. So involving uh, the excellent students that we train you know, into that work so that they might be able to, uh, to share that knowledge as their contingency plan, I think is something that should be on the table. Mm, very helpful. Excellent way to get us going. Anybody else want to jump in on plan B or other intellectual work preparing for the reckoning, contingency, alternative home? Um, well, I'll just add a little bit to it, to what you were saying. Um, since I'm also in Chicago and I'm, I am doing projects with the Newberry um, right now, um, I think a lot of my public scholarship, as I said, you know, my, I started in museum studies and, you know, even though I didn't um, go the full curation route, I've, I've maintained a foot in that world because of its importance for public education, because of the failure to prepare students, um, you know, having any sort of um, understanding of Native history, um, usually in, you know, their um, K through 12 education. And then once um, I get freshmen or sophomore students and having to really start from the very beginning with um, native history before I can even get into more complicated um, ideas around yeah. sovereignty or land status or blood quantum. Um, I think um, one way to do that is, you know, through, through museums, because this is a place that a lot of um, students will go and that is their first introduction to what native people are. Um, you know, as someone who also got my a degree at NYU, you know, I go to the American Museum of Natural History and, you know, it's appalling <laughs> um, as most museums of natural history are. You know, you literally have all of the other people of the world, you know, you have the indigenous people, you have Africans, you have everyone that is not white in a museum um, on display next to um, bear. You know, woolly mammoths. <laughs> um, so it's part of this, this, this continuum and hierarchy um, that um, I think, you know, children begin to, to, to understand and naturalize. Um, with that being said, you know, so the, the Field Museum here in Chicago um, also has a really bad history. You know, it has early, its earliest collections are through the 1893, you know, World's Fair. Um, and they also until recently had pre, you know, old uh, Native American displays. But for the past two years, um, the institution has undertaken this new initiative to redesign their Native American galleries and to invite um, Native scholars, curators to help with the, this new um, formation. So I was invited to be a guest curator on some of the cases and I've been working on this for the past year. And this is really, um, you know, there's been some challenges along the way, I won't lie, but the, having the opportunity to actually help guide the voice and interpretation of what is going to be on display now for the next, you know, however a dozen, 20 years, um, like that to me is possibly more impactful than any like journal article that I'm writing right now in terms of audience reach. Um, and, you know, those, those sorts of um, things, um, you know, not aren't necessarily the first thing that that um, one considers for their you know their tenure file. But for me, what's important is is having having my scholarship reach places that's not behind a paywall. Um, so just building off of you know what all of you are saying is like these these are like tangible ways that we can um, you know try to shift discourses and to to educate people in ways that perhaps you know aren't aren't necessarily you know the traditional ways that we've been taught. Um, 
So yeah, I think museum institutions is one way to go about that change. Thank you. Um, I can jump in, you know, um, so for me, this answer, like A and B are related. You know, um, this past year, I have, you know, a lot of friends who are faculty members of color, especially junior faculty. Um, and I don't think I've talked to a single one of them without the topic of leaving the academy coming up. Um, I think all of us are just like, what do we do? <laughs> you know, and how is our labor being used? Um, and actually, that might be the answer, which is not necessarily leaving, but being willing to leave, you know, um, and realizing that, um, well, and one, being in conversation with people, you know, um, so being in community with people who think, who, who are engaging with similar things, but two, like, um, you know, I'd say like my toolkit is psychoanalysis because I've really had to think very hard this year about my own attachments, um, my continued attachments to whiteness, like structures of whiteness um, and structures of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And I really think that, and of course, you know, that work is <laughs> forever incomplete, right? But um, I really think that thinking about my own attachments and being willing to see outside of the structure and realize that like, I am a whole person without it is to me the first step in trying to rethink what I need to rethink. Mm. Yeah. I, I think there have to be a, a number of different ways to approach this. And I, and I think we need all of these kinds of modes I, I, for one, you know, Tricia, you know, as well as I do, that giving up on the institution, um, all of us giving up on the institution at once would be um, destructive and catastrophic in the ways that I'm describing. And in fact, higher education is one of the least innovative um, industries or business models. If you think about it, we've seen very few new university startups. And it's amazing how durable uh, these brands are and how uh, resistant they are to to destruction. Um, we haven't seen the university collapses that we thought we were gonna see at the start of this pandemic, uh, and we're not likely to. So one thing I would suggest is that, you know, new, new ways of thinking about the institution could be materialized in front of us. And one, one exit strategy for us all would be to think about whether the brands we attach ourselves to, Brown, Yale, University of Chicago, and Stanford are the brands we wanna be attached to, whether, whether we wanna be attached to a different kind of community and a different kind of institution that we might make anew. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, like I, I also know that like, sometimes the difference between hiring a person at Brown is the difference between one last email in the middle of the night, one last cup of coffee, one last meeting with the Dean, one last try, and you can't, <laughs> You can't stop that, right? So as a senior faculty member, I can't stop that labor uh, because that, as, uh, that could be the difference between some, the right person getting the job and the wrong person getting the job. Right, and that could have a 40 year could catastrophic you know, impact. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just couldn't, I couldn't help but draw out the, the uh, consequences, right. Um, That's what my 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 kid is definitely going to have coffee and candy in it for uh, for sort of late night emails and yeah uh, <laughs> yeah your kids are lucky that you're so disciplined they get treats um, Rod did you want to jump in here um, well let's see maybe I'll have some fun with a you know, oh, okay. what would I bring with me um, honestly I would bring with me a pen and a paper and a big note board for the students, you know? Um, you know, I, one of the reasons I love that passage from Derrida is that, you know, in addition to saying that the imagining of the institution or the reimagining of the institution is immediate to what we do, it's also very simple, you know? It means that, okay, let me start writing, you know, or let me start uh, crafting this course. And in that moment, you know, a new socius 
a new community can be brought into being. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I joke with my students sometimes, you know, being from rural Georgia and having very good uh, black teachers, you know, who were veterans of segregated teaching that at the end of the day, I am that old Negro intellectual. You give me, you know, a pen and a paper, let me teach, let me write, and I can do something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me, you know? just give me the material. Just give me the material and, you know, let me do my job and, um, you know, something's going to happen. Right, right. So, I mean, that's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of your comments as a panel were a combination of sort of taking a certain kind of for grantedness of what Rod just emphasized, which is that you're bringing to these objects, bringing to these museums, bringing to various departments, bringing to visual culture and, and, and art history, a whole set of frameworks, a tradition of critique, a tradition of transformation and refusal that uh, is part of the process. I just wanna you know, put that on the extra, I mean, Rob was just saying, I you know where I'm coming from, just give me some paper, but you know, you, the paper has to be in the right hands, right? The paper and the pen. Um, and so all of you are, are, are actually articulating this. And in that sense, I'd say, you know, the knives and emergency packs are, not literal, right? They're really the way we do what we do, not the object that we do it with. So whether it's a knife or an emergency pack, it doesn't actually matter. It's really about the form of, of intensive critique and, and refusal to some degree. Um, so, um, so before we close, I just wanna give you all an opportunity, first of all, to ask each other any questions, to talk about things that I unfortunately stepped over that I shouldn't have or things that have come to your mind that you wanna, you wanna leave us with, you know, in the form of closing comments, because by the time we get to you all speaking, you know, it'll probably be a little bit past 4.30. Um, so I'm just gonna leave the floor open. And, and if you don't have anything as other than closing comments, just offer some closing comments about, you know, how we can, how we can really pursue this kind of, um, you know, intervention that we want, that we want to see. Can I make a quick quick comment getting back to something Matt uh, said earlier when you were talking, Matt, about the, um, you know, the, the English discipline and the fact that it, it's, um, it's been limited by its inability to shed stupid periodization or division on the basis of language, which I resent <laughs> very deeply. So I'm, I'm, I'm on board with you there. Uh, but I just, you also mentioned something very interesting, which is that um, medieval studies in particular have become, you know, the, the, the knowledge, the extraordinary body of knowledge has been produced over decades uh, in, in medieval studies has sadly become the bedrock of a lot of white supremacist um, <clears throat> propaganda these days. Absolutely true. I just wanna point out that we're fighting back Right, we're fighting back and um, Race Before Race, I'll keep mentioning it, uh, was based upon the idea of bringing together medievalists who don't yet have a very strong tradition of working with critical race theory, bringing them together with early modernists who have been doing that since the 90s. And the next iteration of the conference at Brandeis next week is going to actually bring in classicists. So we're going back further and further dealing with Race Before Race, but um, the idea is that precisely we cannot let that happen. We cannot let the um, all the cultural artifacts produced during those um, those time periods become fodder for that nonsense, uh, and so that's that I think is what actually makes our work meaningful. Yeah, let me say two quick things. Can you repeat the Brandeis conference because there were people asking about it in the chat, and I and I didn't want to yes. interrupt. So. Or if you could put it in the chat. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to drop that. I think I dropped the link earlier, but I will redo it. I will drop the, the link in the chat again. It's Race Before Race at Brandeis uh, University. And it starts next week. Great. Drop Great. The link. Yeah. And just to, to really comment on this so important observation you made that we think of social justice and racial intervention being the beginning of a conversation about racial intervention, when in fact the disciplines as colonial forms of ideology formation, we're actually the first racial interventionists, right? And they're, they're coming back strong. But anyway, I'll leave that alone. But that, I just thought that was super important. Anybody else um, in closing or any other thoughts? You know, I was just gonna say to Noemi's uh, comments, I remember how thrilling it was when I was an undergraduate at Howard in 1990 to discover that folks like Martin Bernal were intervening in 
um, the field of classics. And then later on, when I was a um, grad student at UC San Diego, taking a course, a feminist theory course with Paige Dubois, you know, um, and her interventions uh, via Marxism and feminism and post-colonial studies and psychoanalysis in classics. And, you know, just seeing the ways in which both at Howard and at UCSD's literature department, that those interventions became the sites for the introduction of new feminist subjects, new black subjects in those fields. You know, it was really, really an exciting thing to witness and also to repeat. I mean, I, I would want to return to um, one of the things I said in my opening remarks, which is that in a way, I really do feel um, enveloped in such an abundance of interesting work, interesting, relevant, um, just and righteous work on race that falls within the humanities in a way that I that I didn't feel when I was a graduate student, that the sheer volume of material that, um, that lands on my desk or arrives on my computer screen or, or shows up on my television is just extraordinary. And uh, there, there has to be, this is worth um, fighting for and it's worth trying to center, to take all of that material, worth trying to center in these medieval institutions we inhabit uh, here. So I, I want us to sort of think about the ways in which uh, we can bring all of that that joyful abundance and put it at the center of these places again even if that means breaking them a little bit or a lot yeah yeah excellent thank you Teresa or marcy or any closing thoughts um yeah i guess maybe just that um Every single time I return to one of the works, you know, one of the one of the works of art, um, that you know, I've been really spent the last the my time at Stanford looking at it. Always, it always um, exceeds the capacity of any single discourse to capture it. Mm. All right, Teresa. Um, well, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for having me here. Um, I wanna give a shout out to my colleague at UChicago, Sarah Johnson. Um, we were actually awarded um, some Mellon funding for the next academic year. So we're gonna be um, starting this project called Tracing Relations, Blackness and Indigeneity in the Americas. And this is inspired by, um, you know, she's, She's in English and Black Studies, and I'm coming from Anthropology and Native Studies. And I think both of us have come to the space of vulnerability together. Um, you know, there's a, so much that I have yet to, to learn in reading in Black Studies, um, as someone who's mostly been reading in Native Studies and, and her um, vice versa. Um, so for anyone from UChicago who's watching, um, just be on a lookout because we're going to be having uh, reading groups and uh, film screenings next year convened around this orienting theme of relationality that we find um, really important to um, both of those um, disciplines and discourses. Um, but I, I feel like some of the discussions we've been having today has actually given me a lot of new ideas for how we can move forward on that. Um, we do plan to make a website for this and maybe we'll have some uh, virtual component that we can continue um, with this same group of people, um, but we don't have that yet. So I just wanna say thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to, to think further on this project. Yes, yes, indeed. And I feel the same way and I'm sure my director colleagues, Jennifer and uh, Riley and Steve and um, am I missing anybody? Uh, no, there's four of us. I always have to count one, two, three, four. <laughs> um, our, our, I've been super inspired by listening to all of you here, really think in such rich ways um, about the problem, the solutions, the impossibilities, the, the places to both hide out and to be visible, um, and, uh, and, and the role of just such creative thinking, which I think has been so important here. So I'm, I'm really inspired, and I'm hoping our grant will will benefit from and take up a number of the things that we've been doing here. So thank you so much, all of you, for, 
for being a part of this inaugural, what we hope may be an annual conference on racial reckoning. We want to keep opening up the space. Let us know what you're working on, stay in touch, and thank those of you who showed up in the audience and asked great questions and, and hung out with us this afternoon. And we will see you again. There's a, an event tomorrow around at the same time. I believe it's the same link for sign up, but um, I'm sure you can find that how you found this and maybe they'll put it in the chat. So thank you all very much for coming and thanks again to the fine panelists for, for being really uh, terrific. Thanks very much, everybody. Good night.